in 2004, the governor of Ghazni province, Afghanistan, decided he would hold the first teacher training ever held in southern Afghanistan, a region so remote that there was no email, cell phone coverage, internet connection, postal mail, or fax. The subject would be hands-on science for teachers who had never performed a science experiment in their life. The good thing was, for me, was that I was invited to lead the seminar. The bad thing was that I would be all by myself in Ghazni. <laughs> so I asked the governor to limit the participation to 30 teachers, and this is what showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Over 120 stern, bearded, <laughs> turbaned men <laughs> and a small handful of women who were very quiet. From the time they were first graders, these teachers had learned to sit quietly in orderly rows, learning by rote. I had to teach them hands-on inquiry science and convince them that this was a worthwhile way to teach in their own classes. But the first day, they couldn't even <laughs> pick up their chairs, move them into groups, or gather materials for experiments that I was presenting to them. However, by the beginning of the second day, they were eagerly involved in grouping themselves, they'd get their chairs, they'd get their tables, they'd hop up, they'd get their supplies. Uh, and here they are working in groups to do an experiment on simple machines, a lever. And they have rulers, a pencil, and beans. That's all they needed for this experiment. And the first challenge was to balance one bean against another and take note of where the ruler sat on the fulcrum and then they were challenged to balance one bean against five and ultimately up to 20. And they loved doing this experiment. So this leads to one of the principles that I use in my teaching in Afghanistan, which is to use local materials, cheap materials, basically free materials when I can to, to teach. And um, because this was not the first seminar I'd held in Afghanistan, it was just the most, the furthest one out there. Uh, I had already encountered teachers who said, we can't teach science because we don't have a laboratory. So I wanted to show them how easy it was and that science, in fact, was all around them every day. Uh, so another principle I used was to connect every lesson I taught to everyday life in Afghanistan. This is a, uh, a street vendor who was measuring kishmish or raisins for me using a scale very similar to the one that we'd build ourselves in class. And, uh, in fact, after my lesson on levers, my assistant, Adriz, my assistant and interpreter, Adriz, said he began to see levers everywhere. <laughs> and when we had a flat tire later that afternoon, it was Adriz who pointed out to me, this is a lever using to jack up the car. I had um, an ulterior motive in teaching hands-on science in Afghanistan. And, uh, well, the reason I went was because I wanted to help women and children, and I, I was outraged at what the Taliban had been doing. So, uh, and I happened to know a lot about hands-on science, so that was my technique, but the real ulterior motive was to teach critical thinking and to help people learn to think for themselves instead of just accepting what a, a, a respected leader or a teacher told them. So I built a lot of inquiry assessment into my lessons, and the teachers loved doing that as well. They loved thinking, but it was a new thing for them, but they really loved doing it. So here on the, on the left is Hamid trying to be the first to answer a question about how, how could a balance scale be rigged, for instance, to give false weights in the marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the teachers are now smiling. They're really having fun. 
However, the women were still reticent and quiet, um, not as active as the men. So I invited them to a breakfast at the governor's guest house where I was staying. And I told them I was concerned that maybe the lessons weren't interesting to them. And I asked them, was there something I could do to change the lessons? Because I said, you know, you women have got to be, you've got to act excited, even if you're not, because you're role models for your girl students. And if you're not excited about science, then it will be difficult for them to get excited about science. And what Fatima said was, well, during the Taliban era, which had just recently ended, she said, if we raised our hand, smiled, laughed, showed enthusiasm, or even spoke out of turn, we would be beaten with a stick. And that it was only just now, she said, that, that into the seminar that they were beginning to feel comfortable enough that they could show some enthusiasm. But she said they actually loved the lessons, and they were getting so much from them. And in fact, these women were the ones who later used one of my lessons to make an, um, a business for themselves. It was a lesson on uh, weeds, common weeds of Afghanistan, which happened to be the same as the ones I'm familiar with in, in California, and we used them to make a, an herbal skin ointment. And it was a botany lesson. And they uh, found that this ointment was so successful that they first began giving it to other teachers, and then they began making it and selling it. And in subsequent years, I went back and helped them market it and, and learn more about the plants of Afghanistan. So back to this breakfast, we started talking about the next day's lesson. Now that they had said, we're really into it, we're really excited, and, and we will try to show that more to you. The next day was going to be a lesson on the chemistry of ice cream, which they were very excited about. <laughs> and they promised that they would bring from their own homes cutlery and uh, spoons so that everyone could have a chance to eat the ice cream. So here's ice cream, which is called shiryak in uh, Afghanistan. It's a, uh, a favored dessert. It's made uh, right on the street, but the recipe is secret. Other people didn't know how to make it. You, even though you could see it, they still hadn't really figured it all out. So what the, the people do is, the ice cream makers, is they put flavored cream into a, a metal containers and they push it up and down, up and down into large barrels of salt and ice. So while I was walking around the streets, which is something I did, while I was walking around exploring Afghanistan, of course, I wasn't the only one t teaching. I was also learning as well. And uh, this is an example of something I learned. I stopped by an ice cream vendor, and I asked them what, and he told me that these blocks of, I, uh, these were blocks of snow that they had, had come all the way from the Salang Pass in the middle of summer. And I asked him, why would you use blocks of snow for your ice cream making when you can get ice from the local ice factory much, cheap, much more cheaply? And he said that the snow holds cold better. So I decided to build that concept of heat transfer into my ice cream lesson. And then I had to make sure that the uh, ingredients would be available for the teachers so that they could do science after I left. I discovered that there was a local factory, that, a salt factory, that took rock salt from Pakistan and ground it and put it into bags so we would use that salt. The milk, the fresh milk uh, had to come from farmers because Afghans don't use refrigerators in their homes so we had to go straight to the cow to get the milk. And this was the result of the ice cream <laughs> lesson. We churned ice cream using bags that I'd gotten from the grocers and uh, you can see that by this point in the seminar they're laughing mixing together men and women, really enjoyed this lesson. So 120 teachers had learned to enjoy and, and promised that they would begin teaching these lessons, inquiry lessons in their science, in their classroom. And the budget was only several hundred dollars spent by the governor of Ghazni and Plainfair for my organization. In subsequent summers, I continued and still do return to Afghanistan and I taught teacher workshops all over parts of Afghanistan, way out in the provinces and also in Kabul. And I wanted to show you just a few examples of some of the other lessons I taught. So here's um, one 
I'm teaching to a school of street children, and we're talking about the strength of Islamic arches. And the, the way to do that uh, was by balancing eggs, putting eggs underneath a tray loaded with as many blocks as we could before the eggs would break. Uh, the blocks of wood I picked up from local lumber yards, that scraps. When I did experiment, when I was getting ready for experiments in the guest houses or I was gathering materials on the street like those blocks of wood, people, Afghans would see me and they always wanted to get involved. They wanted to find out, what are you doing that? Oh, you're a science teacher, can, can we come to your classes? Or can, tell me what you're, tell me, what, what is this plant good for? So this is an example of um, a cook at one of the guest houses where I stayed. This is Kodada. He uh, was a quiet man, but he, despite himself, he became interested in my science preparations. So for this egg lesson, the trouble I had, a problem I had, was figuring out how to get those eggs to stand upright for the tray to go on them. At home, I use egg cups, but of course, they don't have egg cups over there. So he, he's coring apples to see if an, they, uh, the apple will work. The apple, in fact, rolled over. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work. And then Kodada came up with the idea of using the uh, blue bottle caps on these plastic water jugs. And that was what we, in fact, used as the egg stands. <laughs> these are cracks, which are uh, massive pill bugs <laughs> in Afghanistan. I decided that I would do a lesson. Now we're talking about other places, not just Ghazni. I decided I would do a lesson on, a life cycle lesson on, on these critters. So I got one of those large plastic water bottles and I cut a slit in it and I created a little terrarium for them. And I put it on a display table in a science education, in a teacher education center with a sign, please help me gather more of these caracs so, uh, so that we can watch them. And then I remembered, oh yes, Almost every Afghan I had ever met despises bugs, especially this bug, because they think that it eats people's skin. So uh, nevertheless, the, pe the teachers in this uh, center I'm talking about became very interested in the pill bugs and watching them in their little container. And even the janitress would, would, would grab me as I came through the door and ask me, why did they do X, Y, and Z? What was happening with those bugs? And eventually the teachers, it didn't take very long actually either, the teachers began going out and gathering me more pill bugs. And they would bring them in match boxes and then we would put them in and then they began bringing in other bugs that they'd found which was really a delight to me because as I said, in all my experience, Afghans are not, just not thrilled with bugs. So one of them uh, brought in a praying mantis and asked me about its life cycle. And then another one brought in a rhinoceros beetle with a broken leg and asked if I could mend it. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually these lessons came and the teacher's responses came to the attention of the Ministry of Education. And they asked me to lead teacher workshops for the faculty of newly established teacher training institutes all over Afghanistan. They were converging on Kabul for a training in the new science curriculum. And I taught hundreds of teachers. And the teachers at those seminars had the same response as the people in Ghazni. They really loved the lessons. And they said, we need to have these in writing so that we can take them back to our classrooms. So the Minister of Education commissioned me to write the first science textbook for Afghan teachers. And this is the cover of it, science without a laboratory. And this is the rough draft of it, uh, translated into Dari and Pashtu. And uh, ultimately, it will be distributed in its first run to 22,000 teachers across the country. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I was. Very happy with that. Uh, here's just a few more ideas I use when I'm going to a country like Afghanistan. I, I become a, try to become part of the culture as much as I can. I was adopted into a Sufi group mm -hmm. that meets for, met for breakfast. Uh, these are really dear men. Meet for breakfast, a potluck breakfast every week. Uh, I take taxis or walk 
and I ask the taxi drivers everything from what, you know, what are you listening to on the radio? Uh, what do you think of politics? What's the Taliban like now? What do you think of the American forces? How much money do you make? Why do you drive a taxi instead of? Uh, all sorts of questions. And this is uh, Haroon, and he was describing a recent conference that, that he was aware of, a political conference, a, a voyager that was in town and what he thought of it. I also became part of a delightful lunch group uh, with colleagues at the Ministry of Education, and we would go, they were all Afghan men, and we would go to have lunch together at local re restaurants where I, again, would got to pummel them with questions about what was life like in the provinces where they had come from, what did they think of the Taliban, etc. But we also shared jokes, and I wish I had the time to tell you the joke that had just been told <laughs> in this car. But I will say that it was a joke about Wardakis, which are people who live in Wardak province, which are described in the joke as hicks. And this man, my, this is Sabawoon laughing and laughing at it. And Mir is trying to not laugh because he, in fact, is from Wardak. <laughs> I bought local supplies. It took me a while because it was out of season, but I did find one dingy little purple cabbage, which I was going to use as an indicator uh, in a chemistry class. And an unintended consequence of that lesson was that we discovered, as I said, unintentionally, because we were not testing the water, but we discovered that the water in, Kabul, in the Kabul drinking supply is extremely hard, full of lots of calcium. And I asked a medical doctor about that and if it had any consequences on health in Afghanistan. And he said that many people in Kabul develop kidney stones and gallstones as a result of drinking that water. I used kites to develop lessons on the Bernoulli principle and wind. And uh, I put a large pictorial graph of um, the Beaufort wind scale on the door of the teacher training center and immediately attracted a cluster of people who began looking at the pictures, pointing at the wind or what, what the trees were doing and to determine the wind speed that was current. And finally, I, I think I'll, I'll sum up by saying that I wouldn't be able to do the work that I do in Afghanistan without my board, which is very important, helps guide <coughs> what work we're going to do and what we want to do Next, our big project is to make that book, the lessons, available to other third and fourth world countries, either online, I mean, both online and, and in hard copy. Uh, and also, I've heard that the president is looking for science ambassadors to third and fourth world countries, and on a personal level, that's what I would like to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.